Hi, everybody. Jennifer Schaus here. We're coming to you live today from Washington, D.C., and thanks for joining us in our 2024 complimentary webinar series covering the FAR or Federal Acquisition Regulations. Okay, uh, a little bit about the series. As usual, all of our webinars are complimentary and recorded. The FAR has 52 total parts, and we will run through them sequentially each week on Wednesdays and Fridays at noon Eastern time, unless there is a federal holiday. The recordings and PowerPoints will be posted within 24 hours of the webinar ending, and you can find the recordings on our YouTube channel simply by subscribing to it using the link you see on the screen. There is no cost to do this. You can find the PowerPoint on slideshare.com, uh, I'm sorry, slideshare.net using your LinkedIn credentials. And again, there's no cost to get to that site. We also offer sponsorship opportunities. If you're interested, please send us an email to the hello at jennifershouse.com email address. Um, and now how to sign up for the series. Unfortunately, there is no bulk registration. You must register individually for each webinar. If you go to our website, navigate to the section called the FAR, and you'll find the individual registration links. Also, the recording links will be posted here upon completion of each webinar, and those will take you over to our YouTube channel. Please note we covered the FAR in 2020, so if you are eager to get a jump start, please find these historical recordings on our site. Navigate to the webinars tab, scroll down to the section called the FAR 2020. Because it's been four years, many of the regulations have changed and have been updated. Please use this as a reference tool only. And now a little bit about us. We work with established federal government contractors worldwide, helping them to navigate the market. Our services range from market analysis reports to contract vehicles and back office compliance. Some of the contract vehicles we support are listed here on your screen and from for more information, please visit our website or send us an email. Uh, okay, and those were our services for federal contractors. We also provide marketing and advertising services for organizations who are selling to the federal government contractors. You can add extra muscle to your marketing efforts via our newsletter ads and webinar sponsorship to our in-person event. You can email us and ask for our media kit. Okay, uh, and we do have a class coming up uh, tomorrow, actually, Marketing 101 for federal contractors. This is with our friends over at the Virginia uh, Apex Accelerator. This used to be known as the Virginia PTAC. All of the PTACs have changed their name to uh, Apex Accelerators. Uh, and there you can see um, the link there. This is also on our website under the event section. Uh, also with our friends over at the Michigan Apex Accelerator, we're uh, covering a class on GSA schedules uh, that is also complimentary, and you'll see the registration link uh, right there. If you need help with DHS PAC 3 or the NASA soup contract, we can assist. Again, drop us an email to the hello at jenniferschultz.com. Uh, some sponsored content webinars. Uh, so the federal forecasting app is covering uh, a webinar on Tuesday, March 12th, building relationships in federal contracting. Agile ATS, they were one of our sponsors at our event on Monday night at the Kennedy Center, uh, is covering recruiting strategy, systems, and tactics. That's on Thursday, March 14th. Uh, my GovWatch is talking about RFPs uh, debunked, and they have done some studies and they've got some interesting findings that they want to share with us. Um, so that should be interesting then on Tuesday, March 26th. Again, these are all complimentary. They're on our website under the events tab, even though these are complimentary webinars. Uh, in June, we're going to cover, uh, these are actually Tuesdays, I believe. I think we've got the date there mixed up. Um, but the, the 20th and 27th, we're talking about SBIRs and STTRs with Carrie Palmatier from Palmatier Law. Okay, now we want to thank our uh, webinar sponsors, which is what allows these webinars to be complimentary to you. Um, our friends at GovEvents, uh, they are the premier platform for posting events related to government and government contracting. You can find all of our webinars, 650 plus of them, and our events on GovEvents.com. Uh, we also want to thank Tom Johnson and his team at Set Aside Alert. That's the go-to publication for contracting opportunities for small, women-owned, veteran-owned, hub zone, and 8A firms. Visit setasidealert.com for more information. The Fairfax Economic Development Authority has an online calendar of events and webinars. We want to thank them for posting our events, webinars, uh, and webinars on their calendar. 
the Virginia Apex Accelerator is over at George Mason University in Fairfax, Virginia, and they offer free one-on-one -on -one counseling to established government contracting firms on federal, state, and local procurement topics. If you're interested in learning more, please use the links provided to explore their services, review homework recommendations, register for any of their live trainings, and find useful links to agencies and other self-directed learning. If you're looking for one-on-one -on -one counseling, uh, they are experiencing very high demand, so uh, that's based on counselor availability, and we suggest either calling or using the email address that you see there on your screen. The Greater Reston Chamber of Commerce, they were also, as was the Virginia uh, Apex Accelerator at our event on Monday night, uh, they have a monthly government contracting council meeting. It's always the last Tuesday of the month. Alicia Field is your contact, her email address is there at the bottom of your screen. It's coming up on Tuesday, February 27th, so um, about two weeks away. Uh, and that does take place at the Greater Reston Chamber. I think they have a virtual option. Again, please contact Alicia if you have questions. Bidspeed, another one of our sponsors from Monday night as well. Uh, do you want help winning government contracts? Bidspeed can help. Users can find bidding opportunities on federal, state, and local government topics. Additionally, you can search for teaming partners, incumbent point of contact, expiring contracts, compliance matrices, and also proposal templates. Create your login today at bidspeed.com. They're also an official partner of the SBA's 7J Management and Technical Assistance Program, which I believe is going through some rebranding and they're gonna be um, changing the name of that, um, that SBA program. The Federal Business Council events are the ultimate engagement channel to bring government and industry together. 68% of government personnel report that they attend more than one event each year. FBC has worked with government and industry for 45 plus years to create gatherings where ideas are shared and to help government achieve its goals. This includes agency industry days, cybersecurity symposiums, tech expos, and offsite meetings. FBC provides full life cycle meeting planning and event management. With over 5,000 meetings under their belt, FBC has the experience, systems, and personnel to make your next event exceptional. Learn more at fbcinc.com. And last but not least, GovBrew. Uh, check out our friends over at GovBrew. They are the most read government contracting newsletter, keeping thousands of government contracting professionals in the loop with news, updates, and opportunities in the federal contracting market. It's all in a fun and accessible email that only takes five minutes to read. It's 100% free. It goes out every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 7 a.m. It's filled with great content, event postings, webinars, and more. We encourage you to sign up at govbrew.co, or you can use the QR code you see on the screen. Okay, uh, let's meet today's uh, speakers. Uh, we are joined today by Stephen Ruskus and his colleague, Caitlin Toth. Uh, I will um, uh, move on to Caitlin's uh, contact information here. I'm going to put myself on mute, and I'll let you guys uh, go ahead and jump in. Well, good afternoon, everyone. We are very happy to be here talking about FAR Part 6 competition requirements. Caitlin and I are government contract lawyers with the firm of Baker Hostetler, and we spend all of our time helping clients with FAR-related questions and working with government systems, preparing bids, working out disputes with the government, and then litigating both disputes and procurement protests uh, everywhere that this can be done. Uh, our objective for today is to introduce you to the different sections of FAR Part 6 from our perspective of our own experience and practice. Uh, I know there are a wide cross-section of, of participants in this webinar, attendees in this webinar, and so this means that our presentation is largely from a contractor perspective. Uh, as you know from the title of the webinar, this section is all about the requirements for competition of federal government procurements. However, one of the most interesting things about this section is uh, the procurements to which these requirements do not apply. And to the extent that you seek to understand these and use these in your own business or, or work, I think that's one of the most important takeaways from, from this presentation. As you can see, FAR Part 6 is a relatively short part. The slide on the screen uh, identifies all the different sections uh, with five principal sections including full and open competition and full and open competition after exclusion of sources and other than full and open competition. And these are the primary sections on, on which we'll focus today. But even though this is a really short section, this actually is a very interesting area. There, there are a lot of intricacies and it's impossible to present these issues from all perspectives in their 
many layers in a short webinar. Uh, and it's also noteworthy that part six actually reaches out to multiple other parts, most of which uh, you probably haven't seen if these, if these webinars are proceeding uh, sequentially. Interestingly, uh, part six is one of the few FAR parts that does not have any related uh, part 52 clauses. As, as you probably know, many of the uh, FAR parts that precede part 52 prescribe clauses that have to be in government contracts. Uh, FAR part six does not do this. Contractors actually don't have to do anything under FAR part six. So why uh, is part six important and what's so important about um, uh, our understanding of these issues? It's actually an incredibly active area. Contracting officers do have to comply with part six and when they don't, offerors uh, litigate. Contracting officer compliance is essentially the subject of all bid protests. So even though there's nothing that needs to be done by contractors specifically to comply under the terms of their contracts, contractors watch part six compliance uh, like a hawk. And both offerors and, uh, that are, are awardees and disappointed uh, offerors who don't get contracts are often very concerned with contracting officer compliance in these areas. Next slide. And over Great. to Kate. So, thanks, Stephen. We're going to start our discussion today by giving a brief overview of the Competition and Contracting Act, which is often referred to as SECA. And SECA generally govern, governs competition in federal procurement contracting. Um, the Competition and Contracting Act requires that contracts be entered into after full and open competition through the use of competitive procedures, unless certain circumstances exist that would permit agencies to use non-competitive procedures. Next slide. Competition in federal procurement contracting has become a topic of increased congressional and public interest, in part because of high profile incidents of alleged misconduct by contractors or agency officials involving non-competitive contracts, as Stephen alluded to, and reports that the number of non-competitive contract actions being utilized by the federal government has increased. But competition is encouraged by the government for a couple of reasons. First, when multiple offerors compete for the government's business, the government can acquire higher quality goods and services at lower prices. And also, competition promotes accountability by ensuring contracts are entered into on the merits and not upon any other basis. Next slide. So uh, the first uh, part of part six that we're going to talk about is applicably, applicability 6.001. Uh, what's most interesting about this and sometimes overlooked is FAR part six only applies where the FAR applies. Um, that, that seems obvious, but it has implications. The, the FAR applies to federal agency acquisitions and and that means that there are a lot of different procurements in which a variety of you might be involved with which aren't subject to the FAR and therefore aren't subject to FAR, FAR Part 6. As you might know, the acquisition means the acquiring by contract with appropriated funds of supplies or services, including construction, by and for the use of the federal government through purchase or lease. So um, the following, for example, are not FAR covered contracts subject to Part 6. OTAs, other transaction authority contracts, which you're probably familiar with, and cooperative agreements, which can be critical to certain project, research projects or development projects uh, between the government and contractors. Also, the sale or the lease of federal government property. So all of those are outside the FAR and therefore outside of Part 6. That does not mean that uh, on their own uh, terms, there'll be uh, requirements or procedures for establishing competition, but the reference to the FAR is, is not ma mandatorily uh, applicable here. Also, for example, these acquisitions have to be by executive agencies, uh, which is what the FAR covers, and that means that, for example, the United States Postal Service is not included under FAR Part 6 or covered by FAR Part 6 because it's statutorily exempted. The Air Force, Army Air Force Exchange, um, service or APHIS is not covered because they don't use appropriated funds and Congress is not covered. When Congress procures things, it's not an executive branch agency. 
so it's not covered. And as I indicated, one of the things that's most inter interesting about this section is what's not covered. On the slide here, you see that uh, FAR Part 6 applies to all acquisitions, which is that defined term, uh, other than those at the micro purchase level, generally uh, $10,000 or under, or below the simplified acquisition threshold, generally $250,000. Uh, dollars or below. So that that's obviously a very interesting because if you're looking at whether you're being treated fairly and are having an opportunity to bid on these smaller projects, you're not going to be operating um, uh, under FAR Part 6 where things are properly procured on, under, for example, simplified acquisition threshold procedures. Um, of course, if you review this section, so that's going to reach out to FAR Part 13. I, I, I might have indicated earlier that part six reaches out to other sections. You can learn an awful lot about um, simplified acquisition procedures in FAR part 13, which is not for today, but much of what is of the procurements that you might participate in that are smaller governed by those rules and not by part six. Uh, interestingly, um, you can't break down requirements uh, that ag aggregate more than the simplified acquisition threshold in order to get uh, below the threshold and avoid the competition requirements. You also have to promote competition to the maximum extent practical um, and can't solicit, for example, quotations based on personal preference or restrict solicitation suppliers that are well known and widely uh, and, and um, sell widely distributed makes or brands. So you can see that there are controls on how uh, those smaller procurements are conducted, but it's not the uh, far part. Uh, six requirements. Uh, next slide. So uh, 6.001 contains uh, other enumerated uh, acquisitions to which FAR Part 6 doesn't apply. Uh, contracts awarded using contracting procedures that are expressly authorized by statute. Contract modifications that are within the scope of the contract uh, are not covered. But this is a huge issue right here and in, in and of itself because um, frequently it's the case that a contracting officer potentially could decide to make a modification of a contract that arguably shouldn't be, as a matter of contract administration, that shouldn't be covered by FAR Part 6, but other contractors in the market will look at that and say, wait a second, this is not really part of the same contract. This should be a completely new contract action that is subject to FAR Part 6. To put it in short, this is a big area for bid protest because rightly or wrongly, a contractor looking at another contractor's modification may feel that he's uh, not getting the opportunity to bid on business because uh, there's been a modification of the contract that ostensibly isn't covered by competition requirements when in fact there should be a full and open competition for what's really new work. And there's a huge body of cases on that and a complex kind of subjective set of, uh, of analysis. But, but basically at the end of the day, uh, the GAO, for example, which will look at these issues, will look at the extent of any changes in the type of work or the performance period and the difference in cost between the modification and the original contract. And very importantly, whether the original solicitation adequately advised offerors of the potential for the change and whether the change was the type that reasonably could have been anticipated. In other words, when you see a solicitation and you have to decide whether to bid or not or submit an offer or not, if you can tell from the solicitation that a modification of this sort might come along, then there's been full and open competition. But if you can't, and there's a huge increase in cost and a very different type of work, arguably the modification is out of scope and it should be a new contract action that is covered by FAR Part 6. And this is a very interesting area of, of the FAR Part 6 law. Next slide. The list of essentially acquisitions to which FAR Part 6 does not apply continues. Their orders placed under requirements contracts or definite delivery contracts. Obviously, if you've won competitively a contract to supply the entire requirement of the US government for a period of time for a particular supplier service, the orders under that contract do not need to be 
separately competed because everybody uh, understood uh, when they had the choice of submitting a bid or not that that you were going to have the entire market here. One of the other interesting areas down here, however, is orders placed against task and delivery order contracts entered to under FAR Part 16.5. Uh, another reference outside of FAR Part 6 that really is integral to how FAR Part 6 um, operates. And in these type of task and delivery order contracts, essentially, there's only a requirement that the awardees of these contracts be given a fair opportunity to be considered for each order. So the fair opportunity rules are different from the full and open competition rules. Uh, there are protections to ensure that it's not completely unreasonable, but it's not covered by the FAR Part 6 full and open competition requirements. Uh, next slide. So where FAR Part 6 applies, full and open competition is required. So an essential piece of this is understanding what constitutes full and open competition. Full and open competition results when all responsible sources are permitted to submit field bids or competitive proposals. A field bid uh, is where offers are submitted in response to an invitation for bids. They're open publicly at a specified time and place and evaluated without discussions with the bidders with the contract being awarded to the lowest priced reasonable bidder. Competitive proposals are used whenever field bids are not appropriate, which we will discuss a little later in our presentation. Um, and the competitive proposals are offers received in response to a request for proposals. Requests for proposals generally provide for discussion or negotiation between the government and at least those offerors within the competitive range with the contract being awarded to the responsible offeror whose proposal represents the best value to the government. And a combination of competitive procedures would include procedures like two-step field bidding, where the first step consists of the submission, evaluation, and discussion of technical proposals from each bidder with no pricing involved. And then the second step, field bids are submitted only by those who submitted technically acceptable proposals during the first step. Next slide. So some other competitive procedures. Um, the Brooks Act allows the selection of architects and engineers based upon their qualifications without consideration of the proposed price for the work. Um, competitive selection is available if the selection results from a general solicitation and peer or scientific review of proposals or from a solicitation for a research and development contract for small businesses. And procedures established by the General Services Administration or GSA for its multiple awards schedule program are recognized as competitive so long as participation in the GSA program is open to all reasonable sources and yeah, orders and, this, and contracts. On, go ahead, Stephen. And, and this is huge uh, in the sense that uh, we, we can't simply evaluate FAR Part 6 as if it requires the same full and open competition for, for everything. As we indicated there's earlier, there's a, a lot of types of procurements to which it doesn't apply at all, but even even here, uh, for uh, schedule contracts, uh, the same type of full and open competition doesn't occur because statutorily, the process for getting a schedule contract is deemed to be full and open competition. And as you guys know, uh, you actually don't compete against anybody for those contracts. If you're, for example, a, a pharmaceutical manufacturer and you want to sell your commercial drug products to the government, uh, there's a standing solicitation that you pull down, you submit at any time, you submit a proposal, it's not being evaluated against other proposals. You have to do certain things to uh, ensure that the deemed competition occurs, for example, making price disclosures so the government can evaluate uh, whether the price is getting a fair and reasonable, but it bears no resemblance to the full and open competition that you get in a normal negotiated procurement. Yet, under FAR Part 6, that's described as uh, full and open competition. So it's really important to know when you when you try to use FAR Part 6 to understand whether you're getting a fair opportunity or whether the processes being employed are, are correct to, to make these distinctions. Oh, also, it's important because it's a $60 billion program. And so a lot of government funds go through contracts that don't have traditional full and open competition. Go ahead, Caitlin. 
Okay, we can go to the next slide, I believe. Great. So, as Stephen had mentioned early on, um, disappointed bidders may protest the procurement as a violation of SICA. And there's a lot of different bases that uh, disappointed bidders can bring a protest. So, one basis for protest um, is if the solicitation contains terms that are unduly restrictive of competition. So agencies are allowed to include restrictive terms in the solicitation, but only to the extent that the terms are necessary to satisfy, satisfy the agency's legitimate needs. In this case, an American Safety Council, uh, the protester, ASB, had challenged the terms of a request for proposals from the U.S. Department of Labor for an online outreach training program. In this case, the solicitation had contained technical data rights clauses, and ASB had argued that such clauses were unduly restrictive and did not serve the agency's minimum needs, which was a violation of SICA. Namely, the protester contended that um, OSHA, which was at issue here, the agency here, was not an online provider, and therefore it had no legitimate need for proprietary intellectual property in the form of course content. And the court had noted that the intellectual property clauses were overbroad and that the perfectly legitimate goals of approving and monitoring the provider's courses were already being addressed by less restrictive methods in the solicitation. And the court stated that if OSHA wanted to include a tailored intellectual property clause, it must have limited that clause to the agency's specific needs. So ultimately, the court held that the intellectual property terms that the agency had included in the solicitation were unduly restrictive and as such violated SICA and the FAR. Yeah, and to put a bow on it, uh, Go ahead. it, it means that it, it, the terms didn't permit full and open competition because it was so unduly restrictive that it would, that it would harm the, the variety of offerers who might submit uh, offers in that particular procurement. Go ahead, Caitlin. Yeah, absolutely. Next slide. Another basis for protest is where an agency might be favoring the incumbent. So a disappointed bidder may protest a procurement as violating SICA if the solicitation terms favor the incumbent contractor. Agencies are not required to ignore the benefits or advantages derived from an offeror's incumbency. However, agencies may not unduly tip the scales in favor of an incumbent contractor. So this case, Samsara, relates to the procurement of devices by the United States Postal Service that would be installed into its vehicle fleet. Following a technical evaluation of proposals, the incumbent received the highest combined score and Simsera, the protester, received the second highest score. So the contracting officer ultimately determined that the incumbent represented the best value offeror. However, the incumbent had had a pre-existing solution designed specifically for the US, US Postal Service because of its participation in a pilot program. Sam Sarah protested the award, arguing that the incumbent's previous work on Postal Service vehicles provided an insurmountable advantage and that the Postal Service used the incumbent's head start as a basis for the award. The court ultimately found that Sam Sarah's argument was unavailing because it sought to invalidate the incumbent contractor's inherent advantage. The court held that the Postal Service was not required to neutralize the inherent competitive advantage gained by the incumbent through its participation in a pilot program. Stephen, anything to add here? Yes, yeah, so there's a part six of vector on this because I just finished telling you that the FAR didn't apply to procurements by postals, the United States Postal Service. So what's, what's important here is one, the principle that uh, favoring an incumbent can produce something that's not full and open competition because it doesn't have a level playing field. And that's totally true for FAR part um, six covered procurements. And the other important thing is when you delve into what rules do apply and you have to understand them in all these different contexts, if you look at the Postal Service's rules, even though they're not covered by the FAR, they do have their own considerations regarding competition and uh, they may borrow from the FAR, they may do a variety of other things. And so the same context uh, type of issues will come up in a Postal Service uh, challenge uh, that you might get in a FAR Part 6 challenge, but it won't be because of FAR Part 6. Thanks. Next slide. Uh, 
Okay, and then another basis um, for a bid protest, a uh, disappointed bidder may protest the procurement as violating SICA if the agency failed to engage in reasonable advanced acquisition planning or market research. And we're going to touch on this a little bit later in the presentation, so we can just go ahead to the next slide here. Stephen, you want to take this one? Yes, FAR uh, 6.2 two deals with full and open competition after exclusion of sources. So uh, the question is why would you allow and why does FAR Part 6 allow uh, exclusion of sources if, if it's generally focused on full and open competition? And the reason is there may be legitimate um, concerns uh, of agencies that it's necessary to main alternative sources of supply. Uh, for example, in the interest of national defense and having a source available for furnishing supplies or services in case of an emergency. It's often the case with uh, industries that have low level government need in certain periods of time or have long term contracts that companies can go out of business or not continue to provide certain supplies or services uh, because they don't have government contracts and sometimes it's important to preserve those capabilities for when the government does need them and the government recognizes that that might be an appropriate basis to exclude sources. It's not what you'll find in your typical everyday, for example, commercial item procurement where eight different people make a hammer, for example, uh, but, it, but it is a very legitimate and important, although fairly narrow, uh, circumstance where it's appropriate to exclude sources. Next slide. Again, it's also appropriate to exclude sources to ensure continuous availability of a reliable source uh, to satisfy needs based on a history of high demand or satisfy critical need for medical safety or emergency supplies. supplies. If, if you have in the market one provider that cannot meet the uh, potential demand in the future, you may want to support another uh, source for the, for that same supply. Uh, so this is fairly intuitive. You can see that those judgments are 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 made not on the on the after consideration of the merits of the offers, but on on certain other um, considerations related to what the government will need downstream. What's most important about this is in the next slide, so we can advance one more time. Since full and open competition is the name of the game under SICA which is, after all, a congressional statute. Uh, this is a very narrow uh, opportunity to exclude sources, and it needs the head of the agency to make the determination, not the contracting officer. So if a contracting officer wants to exclude sources, he's got to go up the chain of command, which, as you all know, is, is, is something that is not done lightly. And the fact that the agency head makes the determination ensures that everybody recognizes the the narrowness and seriousness of, of using other than full and open competition for all sources. The decision has to be in writing, signed by the agency head, may not be on a class basis. And when you're doing it, because in the long term it will reduce costs, you actually have to provide in your justification a description of the estimated reduction in overall cost that will be achieved. Next slide. So SICA allows the procurement of property or services using competitive procedures, but this exclusion of sources, um, agencies are allowed to exclude other than small business concerns. So the Small Business Act provides for such set-asides for small businesses generally, women-owned, service-disabled, veteran-owned, and historically underutilized business zones, business, uh, small businesses. Those are hub zone small businesses and small businesses owned and controlled by socially and economically disadvantaged individuals that are participating in the business development program under Section 8A of the Small Business Act. And set-asides can also be made for local firms during major disasters or emergencies under the authority of the Stafford Act. Stephen, anything to add here? Yes, yeah, so this is obviously a huge area. Uh, many of you may actually be small businesses who 
who benefit from small business set-asides and, and other programs like that. So just to place it in the context of FAR Part 6, what you're benefiting from is a statute that says full and open competition does not have to occur when the statutory conditions are met to set aside, for example, for a small business concern. And essentially what you're dealing with is you are having competitions, but they're, af they're after all of the big businesses are excluded. So the, the entire small business program as we know it that allows set-asides is really an example of under FAR Part 6.2, full and open competition after exclusion of sources. And it's a very important uh, carve out. Next slide. So with the uh, full and open competition after exclusion of sources, these set-asides, um, a really interesting aspect of protests um, are these GAO jurisdictional limits. So the Small Business Act gives the Small Business Administration and not GAO conclusive authority to determine matters of small business size status for federal procurement. And what does that mean? Um, so looking at colonial federal health care, um, this involves a challenge to a request for proposals issued by the Department of Veterans Affairs for nurse staffing services. And this request for proposals was full and open competition after exclusion of sources um, for service-disabled veteran-owned small business concerns. So the protester in this case had alleged that it uncovered substantial evidence showing that the awardee of the contract was established by the proprietor of another company and was simply using one individual's qualifications to participate in the competition that was restricted to these service-disabled veteran-owned small business firms. And the agency requested dismissal of the protest, saying that even if this was the case, um, GAO didn't have jurisdiction to hear a, a size determination. And the GAO agreed with the agency that it didn't have jurisdiction to review any challenge to the awardee's eligibility, noting that the Small Business Act gives the Small Business Administration and not GAO conclusive authority to determine matters of small business size. The protesters' argument that the awardee served as a pass-through entity for a larger non-veteran-owned company amounted to a size challenge because the protester effectively complained that the awardee materially misrepresented its eligibility as a small uh, service disabled veteran owned small business. And so GAO ultimately had to dismiss the protest. Yeah, so this is how people interact with these uh, exclusion of sources. As you probably know, when you see somebody you know secretly as a large business getting a set aside contract and, and, you, and you want to complain about it saying they're not uh, small, the, com the complaint is not going to go to GAO, it's going to go to the SBA. So it's, it's, a, it's the technical way that people interact with this exclusion of sources rule that's important here in the small business context because of the SBA's uh, uh, unique authority to make those decisions. Next slide. So moving on to subpart 6.3, other than full and open competition, um, by definition, any procurement contract entered into without full and open competition is non-competitive. However, not every procurement contract entered into without using competitive procedures is in violation of SICA and the FAR. So SICA recognizes seven circumstances where agencies can use other than competitive procedures without violating competition requirements. These exceptions cover common situations where competition is not possible or where the government values other objectives more highly than full and open competition. However, SICA's exceptions do not grant agencies unfettered discretion to contract for goods and services without using competitive procedures. And the FAR um, includes some uh, requirements for agencies when using other than full and open competition that we're going to go through now. Next slide. So like I just mentioned, SICA imposes conditions on an agency's ability to rely on the exceptions permitting other than full and open competition. One of the most important conditions is the requirement that the agency contracting officials justify and obtain approval for their use of other than competitive procedures. So agencies can rely on SICA exceptions only when contracting officers justify the use of other than competitive procedures in writing 
and certify to the accuracy and completeness of their justification. The justifications must then be approved by agency officials of a higher rank than the contracting officer with the identity of the approving official determined by the expected value of the contract. Justi justifications and approvals must normally precede the contract award unless the agency relies on the exception for unusual and compelling urgency, which we'll touch on in just a moment. And justifications can be omitted only when an agency relies upon an agency head's determination that it is necessary in the public interest to use other than competitive procedures or the agency makes competitive or certain non-competitive awards under the authority of Section 8A of the Small Business Act. Next slide. So another condition imposed by SICA is the requirement that the agency engage in advanced procurement planning and market research to develop specifications in such a manner as is necessary to obtain full and open competition. In other words, SICA specifies that poor agency planning cannot give rise to the use of non-competitive procedures. Um, this is particularly important because it precludes agencies from waiting until the end of the fiscal year to procure items and then claiming urgency or only one responsible source because their appropriations are about to expire. And SICA also bars agencies from obtaining through other agencies goods or services that were not obtained in compliance with full and open competition. Next slide. Innovation Development Enterprises of America is an interesting case that touches on a lot of aspects of FAR Part 6. So in this case, the Air Force awarded a sole source contract to an incumbent contractor rather than making arrangements to complete a procurement for the services the agency required. IDEA, the protester here, repeatedly contacted the Air Force to inquire about a competitive procurement for the services and to propose itself as a responsible source. However, the Air Force posted its justification and approval and said that there, uh, due to the urgent and compelling circumstances, um, they needed to move forward with a sole source award to the incumbent. The court found that the Air Force's sole source award was arbitrary and capricious and included numerous violations of procurement regulations were, which were significant and prejudiced the protester here. First, the court found that the short timeline that the Air Force relied upon to justify its sole source award was entirely the result of a lack of advanced planning on the part of the Air Force. The Air Force could not have been unaware of the expiring contract with its incumbent, and IDEA repeatedly reminded the Air Force of its obligation to foster full and open competition for its required services. Second, the court found that the violations of procurement regulations in the sole source award to the incumbent were numerous, troubling, and prejudicial to IDEA. The Air Force conceded that its failure to conduct market research was a violation of procurement regulation, and the Air Force failed to list IDEA as an interested source in the justification and approval, which would have provided a more thoughtful analysis of the agency's determination. Finally, the court noted that a, at a minimum, the Air Force should have checked its own files to discover IDEA, a, a potential competitor to the incumbent, and solicited an offer. Ultimately, the court held that the agency was in violation of SICA and the FAR. Next slide. So looking more specifically at the exceptions to full and open competition, an agency can use other than competitive procedures without violating competition requirements if the property or services needed by the agency are available from only one responsible source and no other type of property or service satisfies the agency's needs. Next slide. So as an example, in AGMA security services, the Federal Emergency Management Agency, or FEMA, issued a sole source contract to provide protective service officers in Puerto Rico to the incumbent contractor, again, on the basis that the agency did not have sufficient time for full and open competition. The protester, AGMA, argued that in making the sole source award to the incumbent, FEMA failed to solicit proposals from as many potential sources as was practicable in violation of SICA. 
especially in light of the fact that AGMA contacted FEMA and represented that it could perform the requirements of the sole source contract. Additionally, AGMA argued that the circumstances that FEMA were, was complaining of were attributable in whole or in part, again, to FEMA's lack of advanced planning. The court found that the incumbent, the fact that the incumbent was already in place effectively and satisfactorily performing could not alone justify not even considering a proposal from AGMA. The court stated it was baffled by FEMA's decision to not seek a proposal from AGMA, despite AGMA's offer of a smooth transition and ability to perform the required services. Ultimately, the court held that there was not enough evidence that FEMA did enough to justify the sole source contract to the incumbent and concluded that FEMA had acted arbitrarily when it awarded the sole source contract. Next slide. The second exception is unusual and compelling urgency. So an agency can use other than competitive procedures if the agency's need for property or services is of such an unusual and compelling urgency that the government would be seriously injured unless the agency is permitted to limit the number of sources from which it solicits bids or proposals. Next slide. The unusual and compelling urgency exception has unique temporal limitations. Namely, there are limitations on the total period of performance. And in any event, the total period, the total period of performance cannot exceed a year unless there are exceptional circumstances identified and documented by the head of the agency. Next slide. SSI technology involved the challenge to the Army solicitation to award a firm fixed price sole source contract to um, Fisher Panda generators. The court here noted that the record clearly demonstrated that the Army had unusual and compelling urgency to procure APUs. The court uh, noted that changes to APU specifications and the decade gap since SSI had last produced APUs demonstrated that SSI was not actually qualified and the Army was not bound to solicit an offer from SSI as it had reasonably concluded that it did not have the requisite capacity. Next slide. The third exception is industrial mobilization. So an agency can use other than competitive procedures to maintain a facility producer or manufacturer so that the maintained entity will be available to furnish property or services in the case of national emergency or to achieve industrial mobilization. Next slide. In Colson Aviation, the USDA awarded a contractor a nine-year sole source contract to supply large air tanker services for the Forest Service. Ultimately, the GAO determined that the agency failed to demonstrate that the contractor required a sole source contract to remain a source of services for the Forest Service. GAO found that the record amply demonstrated that the contractor was, at that time, financially viable and was expected to remain financially viable through the term of its then existing air tanker contract. Next slide. These are additional exceptions to the full and open competition requirement. The first is international agreement. The second is authorized or required by statute, which is like we discussed, small business concerns. And the third is national security, where disclosure of an agency's needs would compromise national security unless the agency is permitted to limit the number of sources from which it solicits bids or proposals. Next slide. The final exception to other than full and open competition is public interest. And this is an interesting exception because it can only be used when none of the other exceptions apply. So an agency can use other than competitive procedures if the head of the executive agency determines that it is necessary in the public interest to use other than competitive procedures in the procurement and the agency must notify Congress in writing of this determination no less than 30 days before the award of the contract. Next slide. Stephen, do you want to take this one? Sure. So uh, FAR uh, 6.4, sealed bidding competitive proposals, uh, as we talked about earlier, the full and open competition is effectuated primarily through 
seal bidding and competitive proposals. FAR Part 6 makes some additional comments on these areas, but before I talk about those, I'll, I'll point out that this is one of the other many areas where, where FAR Part 6 really reaches out in, into a, other detailed sections of the FAR. Seal, seal bids and the, and the proper process for uh, doing seal bid procurements is in FAR Part 14, and negotiated procurements is in FAR Part 15, and those are really extensive and detailed sections that are integrally intertwined with whether uh, full and open competition has been adequate, because if you're not doing your negotiated procurement in, in accordance with those rules, you may not be actually having full and open competition. So here we've noted that the, the contracting officer shall solicit sealed bids if time permits, award will be made on the basis of price and other price related factors, and it's not necessary to conduct discussions and there's a reasonable expectation of receiving more than one bid. Uh, and and the, the important part here is the way it's structured in FAR Part 6, the CO is supposed to request competitive proposals if seal bids are not appropriate. Next slide. So finally, um, CICA and the FAR requires that the head of each executive agency designate both for the agency as a whole and for the procuring uh, activity within the agency one officer or employee to serve as the advocate for competition. Agency competition ad advocates are responsible, among other things, for challenging barriers to and promoting full and open competition in agency procurement activities. Do you have anything for, to add here? Yeah, just for the record, this is actually subpart 6.5, the final section of our presentation. Uh, we've got it identified here as 6.3. Maybe we can make that correction before they become public. Uh, that's it for our presentation. We'd like to thank you for attending. We hope it's been useful and we're happy to answer, not in this um, webinar context, but in any other context, any questions you might have. Stephen, uh, great input from you. And I'll keep this up for a moment before I move over to uh, Caitlin's slide. Uh, so please take down uh, Stephen's contact information here. If you have any questions about today's content, content you can contact Stephen. Or Caitlin, awesome uh, job today, Caitlin, as well. And here is her information. Um, so thanks, everybody, who joined us from uh, the government contracting side, from the government side, or anyone that's just um, uh, curious about the FAR. Um, on Friday, we're going to cover FAR Part 7. Uh, but again, you've got Caitlin and Stephen's contact information. We really appreciate them taking the time to put together these uh, awesome slides, uh, deliver it in a clear, concise manner. Uh, we'll have the recording up on our YouTube channel, usually within about 24 hours. Um, it should be there by, um, we'll say, 5 o'clock today, Eastern. Uh, we will uh, make that small edit on that last page. Um, and I think that is, uh, that's all that we have today. Um, so thanks again, everybody. Thanks to our speakers, and thanks to everybody who joined us.